Hi, everybody. I got water. A couple things to start with today. So tomorrow, Kirsten Madison, she's our Assistant Secretary of the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. She's going to be addressing the U.S. State Attorneys General, who are meeting in Washington this week. Assistant Secretary Madison will be discussing the State Department's role in combating transnational crime. And this includes the flow of uh, deadly, illicit opioids from uh, overseas into the United States. Now, two of the key ways that the State Department keeps Americans safe are using diplomacy and foreign assistance to combat international crime. And that includes opioid trafficking, transnational gang activity, and corruption. So our Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs partners with the National Association of Attorneys General to train prosecutors and other foreign legal practitioners in countries that are critical to U.S. national security. Such trainings help partner nations become more effective at fighting the transnational crime that threatens their citizens as well as Americans. Secondly, I am very pleased to announce that uh, on Thursday, at 10 a.m., March 7th, Secretary of State Pompeo will host the International Women of Courage Awards. Now, the ceremony will feature special remarks by the First Lady of the United States. <clears throat> this year marks the 13th anniversary of the International Women of Courage Awards, and it will honor 10 women uh, from around the world who have shown exceptional courage and leadership in advocating for human rights and gender equality, and often at great personal risk. Uh, this year, our awardees are from Bangladesh, Razia Sultan, from Burma, Nakhnya Pa, from Djibouti, Munima Hussein Darar, from Egypt. Magda Gobran Gorgi, from Jordan, Colonel Khalida Khalaf Hanna Altwa, from Ireland, Sister Orla Tracy, from Montenegro, Olivera Lakic, from Peru, Flor de Maria Vega Zapata, from Sri Lanka, Marina de Levera, and from Tanzania. Anna Alois Henga. The awards demonstrate the United States' commitment to gender equality, social inclusion, and advancing the global status of women and girls from all backgrounds across sectors as part of our foreign policy. The United States firmly believes that global prosperity, security, and stability is not achievable without the full economic, social, and political participation of women and girls. That's everywhere. Everywhere. Including certain countries in the Middle East. That includes <laughs> the, the entire globe. And we have a personnel announcement. We are delighted to welcome back Ambassador Philip Reeker to Washington later this month. On March 18th, he will become the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary and Acting Assistant Secretary of the Department of State's Bureau of Euro European and Eurasian Affairs. Now, Ambassador Riker is a career Foreign Service Officer who's currently the Civilian Deputy Commander at the U.S. European Command in Stuttgart. He's previously served as the Consul General in Milan as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Balkans, Central Europe, as well as Holocaust issues, as the United States ambassador to what is now North Macedonia, and the only blight on his entire professional career. 
He was previously the department's deputy spokesperson. So there's, we hope, hope, for your, we there's hope for your career yet, Robert. Put that to the <laughs> side. Other than that, it's other than that, there is hope, I guess, for Palladino. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, um, the United States applauds the people of Venezuela for their actions to create a peaceful democratic transition and congratulates Interim President Juan Guaido on his successful diplomatic efforts in the region and safe return to Venezuela. However, we have noticed in news coverage that some outlets are incorrectly referring to Juan Guaido as the opposition leader or the self-proclaimed president. Neither is correct. A few basic facts. The National Assembly remains the only legitimate and democratically elected institution in Venezuela. Juan Guaido was elected president of the National Assembly on January 5th, 2019. And on January 10th, Maduro usurped the presidency. Therefore, the president of the National Assembly, and relying on Venezuela's constitution, um, as president of the National Con Assembly and relying on Venezuela's constitution, Juan Guaido became interim president of Venezuela on January 23rd. Millions of Americans and more than 50 countries recognize Juan Guaido as interim president of Venezuela. He has appointed and credentialed ambassadors to international organizations and the United States and numerous other democratic uh, nations and other democratic nations. So to refer to Juan Guaido as anything but interim president falls into the narrative of a dictator who has usurped the position of the presidency and led Venezuela into the humanitarian, political, and economic crisis that exists today. The international community must unite behind interim president Juan Guaido and the Venezuelan National Assembly and support the peaceful restoration of democracy in Venezuela. That's it for the top. Let me get this straight. You're complaining because news outlets are calling him by a title that you don't think that he Not a complaint. Have? Pointing out. Just trying to correct. Well, it sounds like a complaint to me, and it seems pretty weak sauce. I don't understand what your, what, 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 what your problem is. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's yeah. the interim president, well, and we don't well, want you to. You consider him to be the interim president, and as you say, 50 uh, other countries outside of uh, recognize him as the interim president. But there are more than 190 members of the United Nations. So your 50 countries is not even close to half of, of, of that. Is uh, we that are, correct? We are supporting the Constitution of Venezuela and the people of Venezuela. Um, with the Venez We're supporting the Venezuelan people here. And so the United States, it's the time to act in support of democracy. And the news coverage of calling him the legitimate leader, uh, the president, is going <laughs> to encourage more countries to recognize We don't want to feed into the rhetoric of, uh, uh, of the current dictator. Okay. Um, uh, listen, I did have one very brief thing, uh, but then I wanted to get into a policy question, and that is, uh, have you, you're aware, obviously, of the helicopter crash in Kenya and the deaths of the four Americans there. Can you uh, give us a very, well, whatever you can, detail yeah. in terms of the State Department's involvement with it? The families, and then I have a really brief kind of policy question. Sure. It's unrelated to that. Sorry, let me. I got to flip for a second here. You can, I think you can policy one first. Well, know. just give me give me one second. Let me. Uh, here it is. Thanks. Okay, so. You're referring to the helicopter crash uh, in Kenya, and we are, in this regard, we're in communication with the Kenyan authorities on the matter, and we can confirm that four United States citizens were killed in the crash. Um, 
we, we, we can confirm the names of the four deceased, if that is information that, that is helpful. Is that something that you need, Matt? Sure. Or okay. Well, I mean, I think we already have it. You have I'm, that? I'm okay. I'm more interested in knowing what exactly you guys, the embassy, is doing for the families and, and, and what well, kind we, of we contact would say, there is. You know, we're, we're in sincerest, we would offer our sincerest condolences to the family at the top, you know, and all the friends of those who were killed in this crash. We are providing uh, all appropriate consular assistance uh, to the families of these U.S. citizens. And, um, I'll, and I'll stop there. Well, in that case, does it mean helping recover the, 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 the bodies and, and getting them back to the United States? Uh, that is, uh, is a general matter. That is something that consular officials do any time that an American citizen uh, you know, passes away overseas. It's you, don't, some, you don't have any reason to believe this is anything other than an accident, do you? We, we, or we don't have any information okay. to that right. effect, no. Very briefly, the policy question. Yesterday, you guys got a letter um, from the three um, House committees um, once again bringing up <clears throat> this uh, the request for uh, to either speak with the interpreter who was uh, <clears throat> present during President Trump's meeting with President Putin in Finland uh, or, and, and or notes um, and communications regarding that. I, I saw the answer that you provide that's the, the, the department provided yesterday, which is basically we got the letter, but we're not going to talk about our cooperation with a different agents. I would, would like to know, because when Heather was up here, when this first came up last year, immediately after the summit, um, she didn't really give a full answer. So I want to know, is it the department's practice policy to make available to relevant congressional committees the inter its staff uh, interpreters or the interpreters' notes or whatever to uh, is it is it standard practice or is this something that has been denied in the past or has it never come up? Uh, Matt, it's a, it's a fair question, but I got I, I just don't know the answer to that today. I don't I don't have I don't have that answer for you, but I but I but I will get you Can an answer on that. Check to find out. Yeah. I just like to know if it's ever if you're if if the building in its vast history yeah. has uh, is, if there's if there's precedence for prov. I mean, for agreeing to a request like right. this, or if there's precedence for I, denying, I, I believe the answer is no. But but I want to look into it, okay? Before I give you give, give you no, a as in it's never as been asked for. It's not been provided. So this previously. is uncharted territory. That is that I want to look into and get okay. you a proper answer, Thanks. okay? Yeah, please. <coughs> right ahead, Leslie. Um, I wanted to raise something um, yesterday that the secretary said. Um, uh, in his address to students in which he spoke about the Taliban as terrorists in Afghanistan at a time when um, a, a team from the U.S. is in negotiations with, um, with, these, uh, with, with the Taliban. I've looked on the terrorist list. I don't see them as a terrorist, listed as a terrorist organization. So has something changed here in which the secretary believes that they are terrorists? And then what does it say about the U.S. negotiating with terrorists in something that it's said before that it would never do? Mm. We're, right now, um, as you point out, um, we are uh, in the process uh, a meeting with the empowered Taliban delegation uh, led by Mullah Baradar, and that's taking place in Doha, and that's being led by uh, Special Representative um, Khalil Azad, and that that's going on right now. And he, there's, we have several agencies that are part of that from the United States government. Um, these discussions are ongoing, and what they're focusing on are the four interconnected issues that are going to compose any future um, agreement. And those four are counterterrorism, uh, troop withdrawal, intra-Afghan dialogue uh, and a ceasefire so uh, no well I'm, I mean are they terrorists or did he misspeak uh, I the, the, the secretary's words speak for themselves and I'm not going to uh, go beyond um, that I would say we are very focused on um, <laughs> bringing better results um, to what's going on uh, in, in that part of the world, and that's where our focus currently is. Um, 
and we'll stay focused on that. I, I assume then that he's, that it, well, he didn't misspeak because you're not saying that he misspoke. Um, and also he says in the transcript that um, he can travel there in a couple of weeks mm. um, and help move it along a little bit. Is he planning on meeting with the Taliban? I, I have no travel to announce today. Talks are ongoing. Um, more work needs to be done. We're focused on this. Um, we have private diplomatic conversations that are occurring, and we want to give the, all the parties time to uh, work out these issues. And so we'll see. And if we have anything to announce, we'll be sure to let you know. More on yeah, interviews. More on yeah. Please Great. go Good ahead, question Michelle. About his interview. Um, in one of his interviews, he just said that Hoda Mutana would present uh, an enormous risk to the United States if she returned and if those like her return. Um, what kind of risk would she pre present if she were to be brought back and prosecuted for her crimes? Um, yesterday there was a legal decision. Let me. Um, yeah, they, they just decided not to fast track it. But, correct. But what there was kind a of. But, but if, if people like her, I mean, ISIS brides or ISIS fighters, some of whom are U.S. <laughs> citizens, if they're brought back, as he said, others like her would present an enormous risk, what, what would that risk be if, they're, if people like her are brought back and prosecuted here? Yeah. Um, avowed terrorists um, returning to the United States uh, would, could present uh, issues. Um, so that's why uh, Secretary Pompeo uh, has been quite clear in this regard, and that um, you know we're going to continue to take uh, all lawful measures to ensure uh, that she does not enter the United States. That said, there is a legal case ongoing right now, and uh, that's a separate issue, and we're pleased with the district court's uh, decision yesterday. Um, and we're going to continue to vigorously defend this case. And the, and the stance that the government has taken on this particular case, um, do, could that encourage other countries to disavow ISIS fighters or others who came from those countries if there are similar issues or questions? I mean, the U.S. is essentially rendering this woman stateless. She, she was born here. She grew up here. Uh, you could argue that she belongs to the U.S. or she came she she came from the U.S. So, isn't if the, if your stance has been to encourage other countries to take back their people from ISIS territory, isn't this encouraging them to do the opposite? Uh, th that remains our policy. Uh, this particular case is something completely different, and we don't bear responsibility here. We have been clear that this is not a United States citizen, uh, nor is it anyone entitled um, uh, to U.S. citizenship. Beyond that, I don't want to talk any further about this case because, the, you know, legal proceedings are ongoing. Uh, on, on Afghanistan. But with, with, with undisputed American citizenship comes back to the U.S. from Syria or wherever, and is in custody and is prosecuted. How? What is? What, what is the? What's? What's the threat? Uh, we, I don't want to go into hypothetical situations. Well, if and well, whether. Hold on a second. And the who, hypothetical what? was raised by the secretary, as was pointed out by Michelle. What? Now what is the hypothetical here? Well, that, that uh, she and others like her would pose a pose a risk by coming back to the United States. So, so what is the risk if someone is coming back to the U.S. and is being prosecuted here? And likely to spend a lengthy, lengthy amount of time. In, for, in for an prison. American citizen, we, we have a legal system to deal with these. Uh, oh, I know, but what, what, so, what is the risk? I'm not saying that there is a risk uh, for oh, someone. Okay. I'm, I'm not, Never mind then. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure, please. I mean, on that, we've been listening to you guys for the last couple months, and I asked you this question when you were here last time, and you said our policy in this regard would be to repatriate them. This is. Americans or potential American citizens. Mm. It's what we call on other countries to do with foreign fighters who have Syria, people in Syria too. So as you are going around trying to get other countries to follow this policy, doesn't it appear to be kind of a do what we say, not what we do? Doesn't that undermine this policy you're trying to sell as you try to convince 
European allies especially to take back these foreign fighters coming out of Syria? Not in a case where the person uh, in question uh, is not an American citizen. So th this is different. Please, right here, Franco. Again, as you said, these new talks have been going on for a week now. Uh, how would you characterize them? Are there important progress being made? And how long do you think you can continue doing these talks without the uh, Afghan government being included? Uh, did you set a deadline when you think the intra-Afghan dialogue should start? No, no deadlines. Um, to announce now, and th th these are, and I don't really want to go into to much more detail. Um, these talks are ongoing. Um, Special Representative Khalil Azad uh, is engaging on this on a daily basis right now, and uh, progress is being made. So I'll leave it at that. Um, more work to be done, obviously, but we'll, we'll stay focused on that. No, when his trip was announced, it said that he was going to be out there through the end of February. It's now, we're now in March, so mm -hmm. it, basically it's open-ended, his, his trip. Um, you're, you're I, don't remember, I don't have the, the media note in front of me, but it sounds like his trip's been extended. I, I don't want to read into that, but some, you know, listen, when we travel, we have a notion quite often of what's going to take place when we travel. You, many of you have been on trips. You know that uh, what we think we're going to do sometimes changes and sometimes changes right at the last minute. And so um, I wouldn't go so far as to say open-ended, but you know, th this is the nature of diplomacy. Uh, opportunities present themselves. We change course. We correct, etc. Rich, you had a Ven question? Venezuela, OK. Venezuela? Mm -hmm. OK, sure. Um, the measure announced yesterday uh, in regards to property in Cuba, how much does the Cuban government's support of the Venezuelan government, or one of them, um, how much does that play into the Secretary's decision? I'd say quite a bit. I mean, uh, Cuba's support for the Maduro regime uh, has been significant, and um, therefore part of our, our overarching policy is to uh, squeeze Cuba as appropriate. Um, and uh, you know, we, we, we would like to see uh, democracy returned to Venezuela. Yeah. Yeah, please. Just one, one quick follow. Sure. Um, you have sanctioned, or the United States has sanctioned uh, the state oil company. Um, is there a concern that you are sort of running out of options to press press the Maduro regime, and there's not as much to hold over the Maduro regime's head as far as potential or future sanctions or measures the United States or world community would take to, to usher him out? And is there a concern that it's reaching a static point or there's a loss of momentum for the, uh, for the uh, opposition or the Guaido presidency? We're, we're optimistic. Um, I think uh, we're up to, I think I've got the latest numbers, up to 54 countries have now recognized uh, Juan Guaido as interim president. Um, the humanitarian response, global, has been overwhelming. That's something we're going to continue to push. And we, we, we call, now is the time to act in support of democracy. We think momentum is good. Um, we're going to continue to look at ways that we can support uh, Venezuela's humanitarian needs on one side, and we're going to continue to ask other nations to do the same. There's been positive news recently of some Venezuelan military and security service personnel uh, standing on the right side of history and recognizing Juan Guaido as interim president. So we're going to continue pushing. Um, we're going to continue pushing. Since you just mentioned the number again, Robert, 54, is, that's, a, that's only about a quarter of the U.S. of, of, of countries in the world. Is that right? Uh, if you, if you, you know the number of countries. Uh, but we've gotten major support uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, and I would just point that out, as well as Europe. Um, and uh, if we look at the democracies, we're, we're doing pretty well as well, okay? All right. Please, Michelle, go yeah. ahead. I have two questions. Um, as Secretary Pompeo has announced yesterday that he will be traveling to the Middle East next week uh, to Kuwait, Lebanon, and uh, uh, Israel. Uh, what's the purpose of this visit? We, we haven't 
I, I've, I don't have the details today to announce, uh, Michelle, but I know for um, Kuwait, uh, if you remember on our most recent Middle East trip, we had to curtail that trip uh, by a day. So this is very much a continuation of that previous trip. There's a strategic dialogue that we'll be uh, pursuing, but I don't want to get much ahead on the rest of the itinerary. That's something that uh, we'll be announcing soon, okay? Yeah. My second question on Algeria. Do you have any comment uh, on uh, the demonstrations <laughs> there? I think I do. But you're gonna have to give me a sec. Well, ah, uh, uh, I think they have binders. Probably. I've got uh, <laughs> Albania, Algeria. I go by regions, Matt. And then I've got a separate folder just for you, is what I call it. Which also probably begins with an A. <laughs> <laughs> so we're monitoring these protests that are happening uh, in Algeria. We're going to continue to do that. And I would say that the United States supports the Algerian people and their right to peacefully assemble. Well, Michelle, all right. Following on the Secretary's visit. Is it, I mean, you know, considering that uh, the Israeli election is uh, next month, a month from today, is it likely that he would go there before the election? Did that send some sort of a message? Uh, no message. Uh, Israel's an ally. Um, we, we're not going to get involved in domestic politics of another country. Please. Uh, no, 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 let me just follow up on the embassy. Please. I'm going to go to Lali. I'm going to jump. Well, no, I, I, in the council. You're not going to get involved in domestic politics of another country when that country is Israel. What about Venezuela? Huh? Uh, we're any, supporting any, the any Venezuelan any people any and their, their constitutional. <laughs> Lali, let's go. I'll come back to you. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let's, let's, sorry. I mean, you next, Lali, all right? One, two. There we go. All right, go ahead, Saeed. Uh, you, uh, you closed the consulate in Jerusalem yesterday. Right. You know, after 175 years of operation. Uh, but, you know, you're saying the decision was driven by our global efforts to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of our diplomatic engagements and operations. Could you really explain what that means? What does that mean? It means uh, exactly what it says. We've got, um, you know, this is an internal right. administrative decision about uh, how we staff and organize um, our representation overseas. And that, that's exactly what it is. The have, you fun this, have you done this anywhere in the world? I mean, have you, can you cite an example where you have actually closed down a consulate, let's say, in St. Petersburg and say, if you have one, and, and then you know, make it part of the, well, of the, of the embassy? You know? I, mean, <laughs> I mean, we're talking here about multiple missions within the same city. So mm -hmm. um, there, you know efficiencies are definitely uh, to be had. But I mean, we do have other examples where administrative functions are shared within, I mean, you could look at Rome, for example, um, where we have multiple missions, you know, to the Holy See, to the Republic of Italy, to the FAO, where, where efficiencies are gained by co-location, <laughs> and that is something that we do. But they're not part, they're not part of the same embassy, are they? Uh, the, and, and, and you mentioned we, are, we have one Holy See and so on. Correct. Correct. This okay. is. Right. Let me ask you a yeah. technical question. I mean, Palestinians have gone to the consulate to get visas, get grants, get all kinds of things. You know, to go to school, whatever. How, how are they supposed to do this now? Because the Israelis restrict the movement of Palestinians to Jerusalem. It will not. They will not allow them to go as they please to Jerusalem. How? What should they do? All services uh, that were previously provided uh, are continue to be provided. There's been no change in the underlying uh, functions. There's continuity uh, in both the diplomatic activity, uh, what is provided by consular services, um, and that hasn't changed. Robert, do you that this is an internal administrative decision, but 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 frankly, it's not. I won't try and argue the point with you here. I have a technical question about this. What happens to the building? The building we continue to house and use. Uh, we have the, what? the Palestinian Affairs Unit is now stood up within that building, and, and it will stay there. It's correct. Not. Correct. So, in other words, this building will be used. It's just. 
it's going to be used for the same purpose as it was on last week. Mm -hmm. It's just going to have a different name. Uh, and that, it won't be run by a consul general correct. who reports directly back to That's correct. Okay. Is Chain of command become, now reports to the United States ambassador. Is it going to become a resident for the, uh, the, I don't the have, American ambassador in Israel? I don't have any information because on that Because we will report that it is becoming. Don't have, I promise, Turkey? Lali, yeah, let's go ahead. <coughs> Sorry, thank you. I have two questions on uh, South Asia, India, and Pakistan. What is U.S. assessment of the situation between the two countries now? And also, uh, can you give us a sense or describe in detail what efforts did Secretary himself made in calming the situation? He spoke to the two leaders in the India-Pakistan earlier yeah. this week, and he spoke about it yesterday too in the Iowa. Right, right. Um, our position, the position of the United States, is we continue to urge both sides to continue to take steps to de-escalate the situation. And that includes through direct communication. And we, we believe strongly that further military activity will exacerbate the situation. So we re reiterate our call for Pakistan uh, to abide by its United Nations Security Council commitments, to deny terrorist sanctuary, and to block their access to funds. Regarding your second question, uh, this happened in Hanoi last week, actually. Um, Secretary Pompeo led diplomatic engagement um, directly, and that played an essential role in de-escalating the tensions between the two sides. He spoke with um, leaders in both countries, and that included uh, the Indian Minister of External Affairs, Swaraj, National Security Advisor, Doval, and Pakistani Foreign Minister, Qureshi. Since, I'll stop there. Okay. Is there any follow-up? Follow Is there a follow-up on that? I'm sorry, please go ahead. So has he made any further calls since coming here after that? <coughs> he hasn't. Um, but what I can say is we've been in continuous high-level contact has continued. Uh, that's with both governments, um, via our embassies in New Delhi and Islamabad, as well as with the Indian and uh, Pakistani embassies here in Washington. That has been sustained. That's been ongoing. And sometimes we do public diplomacy. And sometimes there's a time for private diplomacy. And there's a lot of private diplomacy that's uh, going on right now. One quick thing. Uh, but, India um, has, um, uh, 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 on use of F-16 by Pakistan, a State Department and the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad said it is looking for more information on that, either in potential misuse of F-16 by, uh, by Pakistan and what information you are seeking from. So we've seen those reports, um, and we're following that issue very closely. I can't confirm anything, um, but as a matter of policy, we don't publicly comment on contents of bilateral agreements that we have in this regard involving U.S. defense technologies, um, nor the communications that we have with other countries about that. Um, so we're taking a look. And we're going to continue to take a look. And I'm going to leave it at that. Let's, let's move on. Questions on State Department okay. business. I'm, I'm, going to go, I'm going to go to Michelle. And the, that's why I, I already called on you. Let's go to some, Lori. Let me go to Lori. Let me go to Lori. We'll try to get back. Turkey's plans to purchase the S-400. Well, how does that stand now? And what will you do if they go ahead with that? We've, we've spoken about that before here, Lori, um, and the position hasn't changed. We, we've long made it clear uh, we would like to work collaboratively on air and missile defense with Turkey, and we have op offered opportunities to, for Turkey to consider uh, <coughs> Patriot, among other systems, over the years. 
We've also made it clear to Turkey that we have very serious concerns with its stated plans to proceed with the acquisition of the Russian S-400 missile defense system. We've clearly warned Turkey that its potential acquisition of the <coughs> S-400 will result in a reassessment of Turkey's participation in the F-35 program and risk other potential future arm transfers to Turkey, as well as lead to potential sanctions under countering America's adversaries through Sanctions Act, CATSA, uh, upon any gover government entities, private industry or individuals that are involved in such a transaction. Again, if I could ask you about the latest on Syria, you're leaving, we understand. There'll be 400 U.S. troops that will remain in Syria after the departure with additional forces from coalition members. Is that correct? White House has uh, <coughs> indicated those numbers, and I'll defer to the White House and uh, Department of Defense on specifics, but what I will say is that a residual force uh, of the United States military is going to remain in Northeast Syria as part of a multinational force in order to prevent ISIS res resurgence and to support, support stability and security in Northeast Syria. It means that there will be more troops uh, from the international coalition that will join the U.S. forces? We are, um, the drawdown is going to continue. <coughs> As previously announced, it's going to be done in a deliberate and coordinated manner. And uh, as we tradition, transition, um, we're going to continue to be working with our allies and partners to clear liberated areas, conduct targeted counterterrorism operations, and support stabilization efforts. As far as um, you know, our priorities remain the same, uh, and, 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 that, and, 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 and talks are ongoing with our allies about the future. Yeah, multinational force. Yeah. Franco, follow up on that. Yeah. When you say multinational force, what are the other nations? What pledges do you have for this force? We, we, we're, we're not going into details. Talks continue. We have nothing to announce. You don't have any place. pledge to announce. Go, please. Thanks Thank so you. much. Absolutely. Um, question on Saudi Arabia. Uh, given the, the case that was publicized this week of an American woman um, who, due to circumstances surrounding a divorce, is unable to leave Saudi Arabia. I wondered if the State Department has any concerns about the guardianship laws generally in Saudi Arabia and, and um, the effect it has on women there. Just speaking generally about um, uh, any time an American travels overseas, they're of course subject to the laws of the country in which they travel, and we have we routinely encourage American citizens to make sure, you know, to read what we we publish and to understand um, the laws of the countries to which they're visiting. In the case of Saudi Arabia, as you point out, married women, uh, including non-Saudis, um, require their husband's permission to to depart the country, um, while unmarried women and children require the permission of their father or male guardian. So that's something that we, 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 we work through. Yeah. Can I ask one follow-up on that and another How American? The Courage uh, Award. We continue to engage all countries on uh, uh, the issue of women and girls' mm -hmm. rights. And, that, and, we, and that's something we, we speak well, forthrightly then, about well, why can't you say it in travel. this case about Saudi Arabia, unless it's not a concern with Saudi Arabia? We, I mean, if we, you're only, we, if all you're doing is warning American women who are married to Saudis that if they go there, they might not ever be able to leave, that doesn't sound like you're trying to change the We, we engage with uh, the Saudi government and, and all nations on these issues. It's something that we do routinely uh, in our diplomacy. It's something that we continue to stand up for and something that, 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 that is part of 
what we as the diplomatic corps do globally. Um, I'll stop there. All right. And one follow-up question on that. Let's do one North Korea. How about Thank one North Korea? Much. Thank you very much. All right, we'll do Janice. We've got a North Korea. Let's Thank you very All much. Right. Uh, um, on United States and North Korea, yeah. uh, Hanoi talks broke down in uh, last week. Uh, what are the next steps in the United States? Is there any plan to have the next meeting with the North Korea? The United States have any planned next meeting with North Korea? What do you have? No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, yeah. But the Pompeo said, uh, Secretary Pompeo said uh, there will be sent a special envoy to North Korea. Do you have any plans? We, we have no travel to announce uh, for its special representative, Began, yet. We're, you know, we've just returned uh, from that trip and we're, we're going to regroup and we're going to we're going to drive forward. But the special okay. Keep but, going one more time, Jen. Yeah, special representative uh, Legan uh, Began mm -hmm. will meeting with the uh, South Korean representative Lee Do Hoon. Do you have anything on this? Because he's I'm, arrived. Yes. Say, I'm sorry, Jen. One more time. Can you say that again? South Korean representative Lee Do Hoon will meeting with the uh, special representative Began. Right. Today or tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow. Have, that yeah. will happen tomorrow. Yes. I, I can confirm that that meeting will take place. We'll be talking about this issue. Of course. We're this, is, this is his counterpart. And so uh -huh. uh, there's very close coordination with the Republic of Korea on this group. So, this Robert, when you no, say um, no plans, so right? I, I'm sorry? You don't have any plan to special. And boy to at, at this the point, I've got nothing to announce. No. All right, absolutely not. When you say that. Um, in the next couple weeks? He said, I hope to have someone, I hope to have a team in Pyongyang headed over there in the next couple weeks. He says hope. He says hope, and we do hope. Um, we want to move this forward. Absolutely. But I've got nothing to announce today. And the, the Secretary is expressing where we want to go. We think, we think we've made progress in Hanoi, and um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna operate from that. So are you saying that forward. there hasn't been State Department contact with any North Koreans since the summit? I didn't say that, well, actually, no. Well, so, what is the answer, then? Have, have, has the US been talking to the North Koreans since the summit? We, uh, I'm not going to go into private um, diplomatic channels, but we remain, I would say, as a general principle, we remain in regular contact with the North Koreans. and. Progress was made at the Hanoi summit. We, we, yes, we did not reach an agreement. But at the same time, we were able to exchange very detailed positions, and that has narrowed the gap on a number of issues. And we've also made clear where the United States uh, and the world stand <coughs> regarding uh, Denuclearization. But you can't say whether there's been conversation um, by the State Department since the summit. I'm not. I'm not going to go into specifics on private uh, discussions. But that I would say be a yes we, or no, are, we are in regular. We remain anything. in regular contact with the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Okay. Okay. Please, yes. Will there also be a trilet with Japan this week included? I can confirm that he's meeting with his Japanese counterpart this tomorrow week. as well. Tomorrow as yes, well. Okay. Thank you. Please. In Afghanistan, with these ongoing talks with the Taliban, and if the Taliban returns to government in Afghanistan. Special Representative Khalil Azad and his team are working to promote intra-Afghan talks <laughs> through a national, unified, and inclusive uh, Afghan negotiating team that includes opposition parties and representatives from civil society, <coughs> particularly women and youth. And so our position is we're going to continue to support a peace process that aims to address the legitimate concerns of the Afghan people and sustains the social and economic gains of the last 17 years. And that means ensures a better future for all Afghans, uh, particularly women and youth. Right. One question about Saudi back here. 
a Saudi question. Okay. Two law, uh, Virginia lawmakers have written to Secretary Pompeo asking him to raise the case of um, Aziza Al Yusuf, who's been in jail for almost a year, says she was tortured. She's a, a woman activist there. I wondered if uh, the Secretary has raised that case and also the case of the uh, uh, American man who says he was tortured in um, Saudi custody, the U.S. citizen. I, um, is, and who is the Saudi man that you're referring to? It's a it's a the Saudi American man who that who was in uh, the Ritz Carlton, New York Times profiled him this weekend. Okay, um, right. I, uh, we so it's Walid uh, Fitahi is is, yeah. is the gentleman's name, right? Yeah. Um, we confirmed that he's detained in Saudi Arabia. We confirmed that we're providing him consular services and that we have raised his case with the government of Saudi Arabia. We visited him today. We visited him um, on the 20th, and we have uh, had, had consular access previously. We, we've raised and we continue to raise uh, his case on a consistent basis with the Saudi government. Anything you can tell us about uh, his condition that since you've seen saw him today? I, 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 have, I have no updates in, in, on that regard. No. And anything? And about the woman the, who's the. And I don't have that uh, in front of me today. I'm sorry. I just don't want to misspeak on that issue. But I would say we. Um, <coughs> you know, I, I don't. I don't have the facts of that case, so I don't want to misspeak, Michelle. From All right, please. Do you have anything on this? And I'm sorry, Congress Michelle. Uh, is considering sanctions on uh, Saudi Arabia. We, we don't preview, you know, sanctions, uh, and I've got nothing uh, to announce in that regard. All right, Robert, that's last question. We're going to wrap Robert, it up, can, and I'm going to try you, please. Um, okay, senators had a close vote briefing yesterday with a senior State Department official, and Lindsey Graham said it was a waste of time. Mitt Romney said he learned nothing new. If senators learn nothing new, what was the point of the briefing? And the other question, really quickly, on Israel. Israel's prime minister is facing indictments. I know you said you don't get involved in domestic issues, but how does that and does it affect the administration's peace plan? Yeah, I'm not going to comment on the, the second question. Um, you know, Israel is an ally. We deal with the, 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 the government of Israel, and that, that's the way uh, uh, you know, we, we pursue our own interests as the United States of America. We take countries as we find them. Uh, regarding your first question, um, that was a closed door session, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, attempt to read out what was briefed, and I'm certainly not going to react to, um, you know, members, uh, our, 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 our elected representatives, not going to do that from the State Department. Um, we uh, continue to regularly engage uh, the United States Congress uh, on these issues and uh, to provide information, our position. Um, uh, has not changed. We continue to uh, gather facts. We'll follow them where they lead and to hold those responsible responsible. Including the Crown Prince? We have repeatedly said that we will follow the facts where they lead and hold those who are responsible responsible. And with that, I'm going to stop. Guys, thank you very much. You have to say about this whole controversy around Representative Omar, do you? Her comments. Not from the State Department. Thank, Thank you, you, Matt.